morning, everyone. Uh, the idea is we are supposed to have a very relaxed meeting, <laughs> but we are already six minutes late, and the program is very tight. So um, and I, yeah, I would like to, to push it a little. Um, we have a welcome address uh, by uh, which is Tiffany House. Hello. Hi. I want to thank everybody for coming. I know it's a bit of a travel to get to San Antonio, and some of y'all have come from very, very far away. So uh, first, thank you to all of our attendees, all of our speakers, all of the patients, families. I think everyone in this room is what makes this conference what it is. So my thanks to you. And then, uh, really, I just want this conference to be educational, informative. The theme is the past, present, and future. We need to understand where we've been to really see where we need to go. And I have great hopes for the speakers and the presentations, and I'm really looking forward to it. But as Arnold said, we're already a little bit behind schedule, so I'm going to keep it short and just say thank you, and I'm looking forward to the conference. And I'd like to introduce Marcia Zimmerman, the patient advocate for the AMDA, and let her introduce herself to you if you haven't already met her. Hi, I want to get around and meet everybody. I'm trying to see who they are. I've talked to you on email, most of you, so I'd like to meet you. And I'm going to be around all day, so if anyone has any issues, come see me. Um, if I'm going in 14 different directions, that's okay. Grab me, and I'll come back and find you. And I will be around this evening. And also, we're going to have little costume parts, so if you don't come and voluntarily pick something out, I may come and volunteer, you know, pick something out for you. <laughs> So anyway, welcome, and come see me if you have any issues. And please come meet me, OK? Thank you. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to the very capable hands of Dr. Bruiser and Dr. Potts. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I prepared a few slides uh, as warming up. It won't take long. All right, so um, the AMDA, um, the president, Tiffany House, and um, Paul Plotz, you have met him. Here he is again in his full length, <laughs> together with me. Uh, we are the, um, the course directors. Uh, Paul is a neurologist, and I'm a biochemist, so we have mixed the uh, a rheumatologist. Yeah, but you did so much on Bombay this year that you're a rheumatologist. Okay. Uh, this is right. Um, there's a saying. It's difficult to say what is impossible, for the dreams of yesterday are the hopes of today and the reality of tomorrow. And this saying you see everywhere. Um, there's another saying by Tiffany House. Uh, the most important thing a patient can do is to become informed about pump disease. Because if you are informed, you can ask the right questions. And if you ask the right questions, you get the right answers. Mostly, if you think the answer is wrong, <laughs> ask again. Um, there's another uh, wording at the, uh, at the top. I, can I point to anything here? Yeah, I can point. Here it says, get involved. And wait a minute. Is this going to work? No, it's not. Okay, there we go. Get involved, get involved, get involved, get involved. It simply means if there's anything said here and, and you do not understand, raise your hand. If there's anything that you disagree with, you bang the table <laughs> and you protest. Congratulations, 20 years AMDA. Uh, AMDA, children, younger and older, um, adults, parents of patients, here's Madeline House and uh, Kevin O'Donnell, and um, they did a lot to, um, to found these uh, patient associations, and Kevin O'Donnell also is the father of a patient with pompe disease, and he is also a scientist. 
So we had very good contacts. Um, at the bottom left, that's the team of Duke University in uh, 1991. So these are the doctors and scientists, and I can't point them out all, but there's uh, Charlie Rowe somewhere in the front row. He was the former director of the group. Then there's Whitey Chen in the back corner. And there is Dr. Ding and Dr. Van Hove, and they were all very instrumental in um, getting the enzyme replacement therapy off ground. And in the very corner, maybe you recognize it, it's me, dressed uh, belonging to the team. It's far right. Together we are strong, but we need to remain sharp. Don't believe everything you read. This is an example. I'm going, really, going to throw the stone into the pond. This is about the physician's guide to pompe disease. Um, I helped writing the very first editions, the first two, and I was just curious to see what was written nowadays. And now it's written, in the past, surgical about diagnosis. Surgical removal of skin was used to help diagnose pompe disease, and I really dislike this phrasing, surgical removal of skin. You know, who wants to have a skin biopsy? No one wants to have a skin biopsy, whereas skin biopsies are extremely essential, not only for the diagnosis as they have been from 1963 on, till present, still in complicated cases, and if there had not been any skin biopsies taken, we would not have been where we are today. There would not have been enzyme replacement therapy, and there would be no material available for gene therapy studies and stem cell transplantation in the past. So I really disagree. Skin biopsies are no longer necessary. I think I disagree, and I will tell the National Organizations for Rare Disorders. Okay, this is the program from 1969, some prominent USA scientist Whitey Chen, Frank Martinuk, and Rochelle Hushorn. She is also one of the older ones, started in 1975, studying pompe disease, still following it, and this is the this morning program. First, we will have the natural history of pompe disease. So what is pompe disease, clinically, biochemically, etc. Then we have a report from the IPA, that is how patients experience their disease, and we have a report from the Genzymes Pompa Registry, and that is how <coughs> physicians tell, think that patients experience a disease. So, and then after the break, but I won't announce that net, but we may have a change of the program, because at 10 o'clock sharp, we have a teleconference with uh, Professor Bach, who could not be here, and he will be presenting about respiratory issues and that's exactly at 10 o'clock. So we, we, we shift the program to be in time. Uh, may I now announce the first speaker, Hanna Rieke van der Hout. Okay, thank you, Arnold. I feel incredibly honored by the invitation to speak to you today about the natural history of pompous disease. It was very impressive to be present yesterday because it very uh, sharply pointed out that 20 years ago a group of scientists and patients came together and they were brought together by the family house and they set their first steps on the road towards treatment for pompous disease. A lot has been achieved since then but to enable us to appreciate what we have achieved it is important that we look back. What is the natural history of pompous disease? Where are we coming from? <laughs> pompous disease is a lysosomal storage disease caused by a deficiency of alpha glucosidase. The deficiency then causes glycogen to store in the lysosome and did the, this then leads to muscle damage. On the right side, on the left side for you, I see, uh, there is healthy uh, muscle tissue with a very regular pattern. And on the other side, you see two slices of muscle from a pompe patient. And that's on your left side. 
Um, the purple dots are lysosomal glycogen, and they cause damage to the, to the muscle, as you can see by the holes, the white parts. Okay. The, the white parts here, can you see it if I use the cursor? Um, in uh, the tissue, and you can see that the, 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 that the muscle is terribly damaged and that there is a kind of a lacework pattern. Pompous disease is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. The gene is located on a chromosome, and that is chromosome 17Q25, Q and it has an incidence of 1 in 40,000. That's really rare, which is not much help to you, but it is. It goes by many synonyms, other names, like acid maltase deficiency, glycogenosis type 2, and alpha-glucosidase deficiency. The disease comprises a spectrum, which means that it can occur at a very young age, at, as the classic infantile form, with no residual alpha-glucosidase activity. It then has a rapidly progressive course. It causes progressive hypotony and a cardiac hypertrophy and eventually leads to death in the first year of life. On the other hand of the spectrum, we have the late onset or non-classic form of the disease, also called the childhood and the adult form of the disease. Here, patients do have some residual activity and they have a milder cause of the disease with a limp girdle myopathy. In the first year of age, patients therefore can present as a classic infantile patient, but also as a late onset patient with early symptoms. We have to keep those parts, those the types of the disease carefully apart. Now let's first turn to the classic infantile patient. We studied 20 Dutch cases and 133 cases from literature and found that patients present with feeding problems, failure to thrive, muscle weakness, and respiratory and cardiac problems. The, all patients had a hypertrophic cardiopathy. And a hypertrophic cardiopathy you can measure by doing, uh, by doing an ultrasound of the heart and then you can measure the left ventricular posterior wall, the LVPV. I hope my pronunciation in English is right. You can see that here, here's the thickness of the left ventricular posterior wall, and here the age of the patient. The cardiac hypertrophy is already present at birth and has a progressive course during life. And it leads to thickened walls of the heart, as you can see here, where the lumen of the heart is narrowed by the thickening of the, of the walls of the heart. The cause of the disease is progressive. When children are born, in the natural cause of the disease, they have a mild hypotony. And they also have a head lag, as you can see here, where the child is unable to support the head. At birth, this is mild, but in time, this progresses. And here you see that in time, the anti-gravity movements diminish. Then children will not, ha will ha not have the, uh, the strength anymore to drink and to breathe properly and they will need tube feeding and oxygen. Finally, they are unable to survive without a ventilator. When we looked at survival, we found that all children died before the age of one year and with a median age of six to eight months. The major cause of death was cardiac failure and respiratory failure. We know from autopsy studies in the past 
that glycogen does store in the central nervous system. And it stores throughout the whole uh, system, especially in the spinal cord, the brain stem, the cerebellum, that's a small uh, brain, and in the cerebral cortex. It is important to follow this up because we know that, uh, that uh, classic infantile patients with pompa disease can develop white matter abnormalities. Here you see an MRI, that's the slice A. You see a slice made like this. On the outside, here, you have the gray matter. That's where we think and where movements uh, have their uh, initiation. And then the gray matter uh, is connected with the other gray matter areas and also with our hands and our feet, our muscles, by connections which lie in the white matter. Well, white matter is called white matter, but as on this slide, the white matter does not look normal. It's abnormal. Therefore, we follow this up in 10 patients up till the age of 12 years. We found that their cognition was normal to mildly delayed. However, in two children, we found a delayed processing speed, which matches the white matter abnormalities. Therefore, we should take an, uh, keep a good eye and carefully follow up the cognition of these patients. Now let's turn to the other part of the spectrum. Let's first see how the children were, do were doing when they were not treated. Children can present either with symptoms, as you can see in this boy, but we might also find siblings of patients with very few or no symptoms. But then again, children may also present with very severe symptoms. As you can see here, a boy with a severe muscle weakness, he has a, a, a changed uh, course of his uh, walking, the way he walks is different, he has a hard leg, which he sh should not have at this age, and if you have a look at his face, you see that he has facial muscle weakness. And this is a boy before treatment. So it's a very diverse mixed group. We, we took a better look at this group and uh, <coughs> uh, studied 31 patients with a childhood onset without any treatment. We uh, studied uh, the patients who were uh, diagnosed at uh, the Erasmus Medical Center in the Center for Lysosomal, Met uh, Lysosomal and Metabolic Diseases, or patients who were referred to our center. They came from the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Greece, the UK, and the US. So it was a very international group. They had a median age of first symptoms at 2.3 years, with a median age of diagnosis at four years. The most common first symptoms were a, develop, a delayed mo motor development, symptoms related to lump girdle weakness like falling, difficulty climbing stairs, and problems with running in spor or sports. And if you think back as a patient on your youth, you probably will recognize that that is what you had as well. A lot of the patients also had fatigue, diarrhea, and problems raising the head. 21 of the 31 patients had the IVS1 mutation, while one third of the patient group had other mutations. There was no difference in age of onset and age of diagnosis between these two groups. Their muscle strength and lung function was significantly lower at the same age in the other mutation group. Both um, groups had severe disability because of their affliction. They needed ventilator and wheelchair. Two out of the 31 patients had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, my and none had, uh, of these uh, two had the IVS1 mutation. We found that patients with a childhood onset of pompa disease 
can be severely affected at a young age. One third of the patients in this group required a wheelchair and, ventil uh, and or ventilation. And this is in line with earlier research we did on the IPA survey where we found out that in the group, group under uh, five years of age, sorry, under 15 years of age, 45% of the patient needed a wheelchair, while 25% needed a respiratory support. So the disease does lead to a significant disability. 32%, so one third of the patients, were diagnosed pre-symptomatically, either because they had an elevated CK or transaminases. This happens when, uh, for example, a family doctor does uh, blood examination because a patient is very tired. He might look at Pfeiffer's disease and then find a high CK or transaminases. Another uh, reason why uh, patients presented pre-symptomatically was because there were cyberlings for pompa patients. From this gr uh, group of pre-symptomatic patients, one, uh, nine of the 10 had an IVS1 mutation and five of these patients developed symptoms during their childhood. Here you see a patient who was pre-symptomatically. Here at the age of four and a half years, where he moves really well. And here after follow-up of six years, and he's still doing great. So, although patients may develop symptoms, and we do have to follow up them carefully, it might be that these patients only develop uh, the symptoms at a very old age. We can conclude that in this childhood group, there is a significant burden of disease. And now, the adults. How was the cause of the disease before treatment? And yet, in the adult form of the disease, patients can develop uh, symptoms at any age. They may have uh, had some symptoms in uh, their youth, but really become aware of that during adulthood. Here you see such a patient at the age of 12 years, where he's doing quite well, and then at the age of 16 years, where he does have um, uh, muscle weakness and has to wear uh, this to uh, avoid the scoliosis, and then at the age of 32 years, where he has lost all his anti-gravity movements and is on the respirator. And this was when he was not treated. We did uh, um, a longitudinal prospective study on 94 patients. We found that the most frequently affected uh, muscles we situated in the shoulders, shoulder abduction, that's this movement, in the abdomen, the paraspinal muscles, and around the hips. And those are all the muscles which are uh, reddish. The uh, muscle on the front of the leg here, that is uh, the quadriceps, was affected only in 55% of the patients. And distal muscles, that means the muscles of your hand and the muscles of your feet, were only um, affected in 10% of the patients. The most severely affected muscles uh, were situated around the hip girdle, the abdomen, and the paraspinal muscles. Early in the course of the disease, were affected the muscles of the shoulder abduction, around the hip, the abdomen, and the paraspinal muscles, where the distal muscles were affected much later in the disease. There are also muscles who, who are less familiar uh, affected in pompous disease, but can occur nevertheless. It's about one third of the patients had bulbar muscle weakness. And bulbar muscle weakness means, means weakness of your face and uh, your mouth. Some of the patients also had a ptosis. That means a drop of your eyelids, which makes it difficult to look up because then your eyelid is in the way. 
and they also had weakness of uh, the muscles around the scapula and they would cause scapular winging. That's when your uh, shoulder sticks out a little bit. In this group of scapular winging, the occurrence of bulbar muscle weakness was higher, 71%. And this group also was the group with less strength in the muscles around the shoulder. We followed up 66 patients. And we found that muscle strength decreases over time, as you can see here. Here, the strength of the muscle is measured by handheld dynamometry. That's the little apparatus you probably know. The doctor can put it on your, uh, on your muscles, and then you have to make a movement. And it will give a strength in Newton. This strength was. Uh, uh, is here in, in a percentage of, uh, of a certain group of muscles, and it will go down over time during the years of the disease. It goes f steeper down if you have um, a longer disease duration. Here, patients were with a normal pulmonary function and a disease duration of less than 15 years, and here, patients with uh, normal pulmonary function and a disease duration of more than of more than 15 years. And then it, it goes even steeper down if you have an abnormal pulmonary function. So that means that muscle strength does decrease over time, either measured by handheld dynamometry or by hand, which is an MRC score. Strength declined significantly in the elbow flexors, hip abductors, knee extensors, and knee flexors. And the most important factors associated with a more rapid decline in muscle strength were longer disease duration, diminished pulmonary function, and study entry. And then we looked at lung function. And here you see the vital capacity in sitting and supine position. It is uh, expressed as a percentage of the predicted normal value. So how much is your uh, uh, lung function when um, compared to a normal person? And that is then uh, in percentage for each individual patient. We studied uh, 17 children and 75 adults. In light gray, you see the vital capacity in sitting position. That's this. And then in dark gray, you see the vital capacity in supine position. <coughs> As the uh, gravity uh, will uh, wear your muscles down when you uh, lie, you normally the vital capacity in supine position is lower than it is in sitting position. We call this a postural drop. If you have a postural drop of more than 25%, that is an indication that your diaphragm is weak. And that is important because when you sleep, you need your diaphragm to breathe. When it is weak, you might get um, respiratory problems during your sleep. So then you have to evaluate that. We found that 74% of all patients had a vital capacity below 80%. So that means a lung function which is abnormal. And 53% of the children who had a lung function which was abnormal, still a significant percentage. We also found uh, seven patients who did not have any complaints but uh, had a uh, bad vital capacity anyway. And we also found that uh, two patients uh, had a normal vital capacity when sitting, but a very, ba a very big postural drop, and they had to be evaluated for ventilatory need during the sleep. This means that it is important to follow up vital capacity, and we should do it both in sitting and supine position. Lung function does decline over time, as you can see here. Here on the uh, left corner, A, the vital capacity, capacity sitting upright, B, 
vital capacity sitting supine, C, the maximum inspiratory pressure, and D, the maximal expiratory pressure. We followed this up in 53 patients and found that uh, the lung function does decrease significantly over time. Vital capacity in upright position declined 0.9% while it declined in 1.2% uh, per year in supine position. And this uh, was uh, seen in the inspiratory and expiratory pressure as well as these two these, uh, decl uh, declined uh, signif significantly as well. Although those, these percentage may not be that big, it has a big impact on life because in this follow-up period, three of our patients became ventilatory dependent, five increased their numbers of hours of ventilation, and one patient died. So uh, an increase which might seem not so big, and a decrease which might seem not so big, has a big influence on life because it's a decline each year. Predictors of poor respiratory status are male gender, severe skeletal muscle weakness, long disease duration, and males were doing worse. They had more severe pulmonary involvement than females. They had a mean vital capacity which was significantly lower. They use mechanical ventilatory uh, support more often, and the decline of the cause of the disease was significantly different between males and females. And both the uh, decline of the muscle strength and the decline of, muscle of uh, uh, lung function both had an impact on life, because it made people use wheelchairs and uh, artificial ventilation. Here you see the wheelchair use and the use of artificial ventilation here, the age of the, pa of the patient at which they um, have to use that. Mostly the decline of the, uh, the lung function and muscle strength goes together. But sometimes people present at a young age because they have to use the ventilator and that at an older age they, ha they need a wheelchair. And this is important to remember, because in some other mu uh, muscle diseases, this is different. And then the neurologist of another doctor will think, well, this uh, patient is still walking, so lung function probably is good. It's not like that in pompous disease. Here you see a patient um, who is still able to walk, but then within time, He get a little bit. Of, he gets a little bit of dyspnea, and then he will sit down. He's able to walk quite a, a distance, as you can see. He sits down and has to ventilate himself. So that's a, a good uh, example of how people are able to walk, but still need ventilatory support. Six patients were able to walk and needed a ventilator. We also studied if cardiac problems occurred in adult problem, uh, pompa patients. We found cardiac hypertrophy maximum 5 to 10 percent. We found rhythm disturbances, that's a Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, syndrome, that's a, a sort of a, a rhythm disturbance and a short PR interval in maximum 10% of the patients. And um, we found other EKG uh, abnormalities, but those were probably unrelated to pompous disease. Although cardiac problems do occur in pump, adult pompous disease, they are rare. And these findings are in sharp contrast to those found in classic infantile pompa patients. We also studied hearing problems in the adult group. We found that 21% of the patients had clinically relevant hearing loss, but this was not more frequent than in the general population. In the children, we found one patient with conductive hearing loss due to middle ear effusion. So hearing problems are not more frequent than in the general population in children and adult pompa patients. 
In a group of 268 patients, we studied survival. And we found, this is a survival curve, and at the beginning of the study, 100% of the patient was alive. And on the horizontal axis, you see the time from diagnosis. After five years after the diagnosis, 95% of the patients is alive. 50% of the patients is still alive 27 years after the diagnosis. We compared this with the survival in the general Dutch population and found that the mortality in pompa patients was higher than in the general Dutch patient population. So the disease is progressive, it causes disability, and patients have a lower survival than in the general population. <coughs> We also looked at associated factors, factors which uh, were more uh, occurring in uh, the group uh, who had a bad survival. This was age at study entry, the disability level at the study entry, and Rotterdam handicap scares, scores. You can see this in this, this in the survival course, curve. The gray line is uh, the group with no wheelchair or respiratory support. They do pretty good on the survival uh, curve. Then the, the red and the green line are the groups with either wheelchair use or respiratory support. And then in the blue line, that's the lower, lowest line, you see the patients who use both wheelchair and respiratory support. They have a worse survival. So. What have we learned from all these studies on the natural cause of the disease, the untreated patients? We have learned that pompa disease presents as a broad spectrum. It has a broad range of symptoms, mostly related to skeletal muscle weakness. Hearing deficits and cardiac hypertrophy mainly occur in infants. Respiratory dysfunction is a serious, serious threat to all. This should be monitored in sitting and supine position, irrelevant of other muscle weakness. It is a progressive disorder. It leads to considerable disability and has a large impact on daily life, as you all know. I thank you very much, and uh, I'm, I'm, I, if you have any questions, just ask. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Yes, please. Who are pre-symptomatic, a uh, patient with pompe disease, who are pre-symptomatic, do you put this patient on uh, enzyme replacement therapy? Do you start them on enzyme replacement therapy? I think um, um, the question is if, if, if we start uh, patients on enzyme replacement therapy is if they are pre-symptomatically. But, uh, uh, but confirm diagnose. And we are with a confirmed yeah. diagnosis, yeah. Um, I think that's an interesting question, since we all know that if we start enzyme replacement therapy early, it has a better outcome. Um, however, as um, I pointed out, with a patient we followed up for six years, patient might not develop symptoms until they're really old. Um, we followed the, the child from four and a half to ten and a half years. Nowadays, he's 12 years. He still not, does not have any symptoms, and I don't know if he will get symptoms when he's 20 or 30 or 40 or 50. So what we do is that we carefully follow up the patient. We see them each half year, and we uh, we do all the examinations. And if they um, decrease uh, in the outcome of any examination, then we will start. But um, I think up till now, uh, it is an area in which uh, we would like more, uh, more knowledge, an area of interest, of important interest, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, if you have any other question, yeah. I'm walking around. Fe please feel free to ask me anything. I, I'd much rather, rather have you asking me everything than worry too much. Okay. I can have another question. <laughs> you have another one. <laughs> Sorry, <yeah. laughs> 
Um, uh, do you have experience in treating patients with uh, infantile pompe disease? Because I see that most of your patients are in the adult or juvenile form. Uh, because my experience in Egypt actually is not very good in treating patients with, uh, um, uh, with uh, infantile form in the first year of life because most of them, even if started on enzyme replacement therapy, they, um, uh, they die. I have only one successful history for which the patient is now seven or eight uh, years old and she's doing well on enzyme replacement therapy. So I would like to know what's your end. We have a lot of experience actually. We have a large group of uh, classic infantile patients. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a learning curve. Um, right now we, uh, our results are quite good, but I do think that a little bit later uh, other people will talk about it. Um, uh, so um, I think what would be best is just wait for the, the late presentations and yeah. I'll discuss it with you uh, afterwards as well because oh. I can go on and on and on about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> One don't want to bother you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> the next speaker is Chris van der Meijden and he will report on the results of the IPA pompe patient registry. Good, uh, good morning. Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organiz organization for inviting me. Is it on? I just have to bend my knees a little. <laughs> uh, thanks uh, to the organization for inviting me to present our work on uh, the pump survey. The pump survey started in 2002. At yeah, I think I'm, yeah, maybe I can use the regular mic. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, is, this, is this better? Ah, yeah. uh, great. Well, the pump survey started in uh, 2002. Um, and at that moment, a treatment for pump disease was on the horizon. The first trials were being performed and quite uh, successful. However, we realized that there was little information on children and adults with pompe disease. We didn't really know how the disease manifests in those patients or nor how it affects their daily life. We also realized that this was the moment we needed to start studying those patients. Because if you would wait, you would lose the opportunity to study natural cause of disease since you can't say to a patient, well, there's a treatment, but we're going to wait a few years to give it to you because we want to study how, the how sick you will get. Also, we realized that if you want the study to effects of the disease, you will need data to compare it to. You will need untreated patients to compare to treated patients. So, an efficient tool was needed, which was able to reach patients from around the world, not only the patients in the Netherlands, but around the world, and gather information from them as uh, efficient as possible. The tool we came up with was the pump survey. It uh, was a collaboration between the Erasmus uh, University Medical Center and uh, the International Pump Association. With the help of patients, experts in the field, and all the available literature, we developed a survey that aimed to describe the problems and how the disease affects the daily life of the patients. Through the patients' organizations linked to the IPA, many patients were invited to participate. In the first two years, 255 patients joined the survey. And at the moment, 443 patients have joined, filling out over 2,300 questionnaires, which is amazing. This has been a true pioneering project, where, which is a unique example how patients and doctors work together to further the understanding of a disease. At first, we looked how, how the disease affected the life of the patients, of you. We described common known symptoms like uh, the limb girdle weakness or the respiratory problems. <laughs> However, we also learned new things like fatigue. Three quarter of the patients indicated in the questionnaires they were fatigued. This is way more than the general population. Also, participation in daily life is affected. This means, uh, uh, if patients are able to go outside, do their groceries, uh, just the normal daily life things. We found that uh, mainly uh, uh, outdoor activities 
and activities that involved work or study were affected. Quality of life was also reduced compared to the general population. If you look at this figure, it represents the different dimensions of quality of life. You can see that, for example, on the physical functioning scale, patients uh, have a decreased quality of life compared to the general population. However, if you look at uh, uh, mental health, you see that patients and the general population have about the same quality of life levels. This might indicate that patients learn to adapt and cope with the disease over time. We also looked how the disease behaves over time. We found that there is a big delay between uh, the moment patients have their first symptoms and when they get diagnosed. In almost half of the patient, it took over a year from, from the first symptoms to a diagnosis. And in two-thirds of those, it actually took over five years. In this figure, you can see the different events that take place in the life of pulp patients. On the x-axis, you see the age. Uh, you see the age. Well, there it is. You see the age at which the events take place. On the y-axis, you see the different events. The grey bars represent the 10th to the 19th percentile of the age at which the event takes place, with the black line being the median. If you look at the figure, you can see that patients first have the first symptoms, then get diagnosed, then have motor and respiratory problems, and eventually uh, start relatively late with ERT. However, the age at which they start with ERT is approximately the same as in other major trials like the LOTS study. We also looked uh, what uh, uh, time does with disease progression. We looked at age and disease duration and found that the disease severity mainly increases with disease duration. If you look at this figure, you see different age groups. Uh, patients uh, who are, are, have their disease less than five years until patients who have the disease more than 15 years. The gray and uh, white bars represent the percentage of patients that use a wheelchair or ventilator. You can see that how longer patients have the disease, how more likely they are to use a wheelchair or a ventilator. When in uh, 2006 a treatment became available, we were able to uh, look at its effects because, well, we already had uh, all those natural course data. For example, we looked at uh, fatigue and participation, representing these two figures. I'll explain them. On the x-axis, you'll see the time before and after patients start ERT in years. The red line is the moment they start with the treatment. The y-axis represents a fatigue severity scale scores, with higher scores meaning patients are more fatigued, and participation scores, where higher scores means patients are, have better particip participation in daily life situations. You can see that before the start of a treatment, patients were fatigued and became less fatigued. And uh, if you look at participation, you can see that patients lost their ability to participate in daily life situations, which stabilized after the start of treatment, which is a positive thing. Same results uh, were measured for quality of life as well. So, so far we have uh, learned a lot about the disease. We looked at, our, at symptoms, we looked at fatigue, quality of life, participation, we learned about the progress, progressive character of the disease, and uh, that treatment has a positive effect on it. However, we did way more with the survey. Until the survey, no information on survival uh, was there on adults and uh, children with pump disease. The degree of survival for a patient with classic, classic infantile phenotype was well known. However, for adults, it's more harder because the disease progresses slower and there are only a limited number of patients. While the survey wasn't designed to measure survival, through the patient organizations, we received information if patients have died or not. As Dr. Van der Hout already uh, told, uh, told you, survival is decreased in untreated patients compared to the general Dutch population. I tried to represent it in this figure where uh, the red figures mean uh, represent death rates 
in the general Dutch population on the left and the Pompe uh, community on the right. We also found that enzyme, enzyme replacement therapy in increased the survival. At any point in time, a patient on treatment has a 59% less chance to die compared to a patient who isn't on treatment. This information also proved important for the reimbursement discussion because, well, survival is an important outcome measure. We also did many other things with the POMPA survey. The uh, information we got from it we used for other projects like uh, projects on newborn screening or health economic uh, projects. We used the infrastructure to send out all the questionnaires and the survey itself proved uh, as a uh, source of inspiration for clinical questionnaires like the RPACT or the QMFT. So, we looked at uh, the consequences of uh, the disease, its progression, the effects of treatment and survival. However, we also learned from the survey how to study our rare disease efficiently. As I said before, starting early is very important before treatment is available. Also, you need an uh, efficient tool to study the disease to obtain a large amount of data. POMP survey, for example, is now one of the largest databases uh, in the world with a very consistent uh, follow-up. As I said before, the collaboration is also very important. The patient organizations and the patients have proven uh, true partners providing a uh, very consistent uh, follow-up, which is uh, represented by the high response rates we have every year. Therefore, the POMP survey is a key example how patients and doctors can work together to collect data and further the knowledge of the disease. This collaboration has been already going on for 10 years and has led to one of the most successful projects in the field. And it also resulted in many, many publications. We also learned a lot about working with patient-reported outcomes, which are different from clinical outcome measures like uh, blood pressure or walking uh, distance, because uh, there isn't a machine that can measure your symptoms or how you're feeling or your quality of life. It is reported by you, the patients, without any interpretation by a doctor or anybody else. And this is also very relevant to you because only you can tell us uh, how you're doing and how the disease affects your life, which is uh, also important to us because it's nice to know that the treatment, for example, increases the walking distance with X meters, but we want to know if that means if you're able to do your groceries or you can walk outside, which gives us way more information than only the clinical outcome measures. This is also recognized by organizations like the FDA who require uh, these uh, patient reported outcomes if you want to register new uh, medications. You might think, well, after 10 years, you guys have uh, studied us for a long time. Are we done yet? But that's not true. We still uh, use your information. We still learn from you every day. There are a lot of unanswered questions and projects we want to undertake. And with new therapies on the horizon, your uh, current follow-up uh, follow will be used to assess if these therapies are effective of need or not. So it's important to continue to participate. Because the success of the survey is dependent on your participation. If you already uh, have joined the survey, good, thank you. We're very happy uh, with, uh, with all, the, uh, all the questionnaires you've been filling out. And if you want to participate, you can contact me or Marcia uh, for a consent form, form. We have an online version and a paper version you can receive through the mail. And uh, if you well want to think on it or have any questions later, you can send me an email address which is at uh, the bottom uh, of the slide. I would like to thank everybody who was involved in the POMP survey. All the patients who have been filling out questionnaires, the patient organizations doing a tremendous amount of work reaching all the patients and our team in Rotterdam. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are there any questions? Are there any questions? <laughs> we, we have plenty of time, so yes, yeah. please. Um, the POMP survey hasn't because you need uh, to be a... Oh, the question was uh, uh, d d if you looked at carriers, if they present any symptoms. 
Uh, we didn't do the pump survey because uh, one of the questions is if you're a diagnosed uh, patient and uh, well if you aren't uh, you can't uh, you can't participate. Yeah. Tracking other uh, clinical features such as aneurysms, cancers, etc. And do you have any data that you can share? Um, aneurysms, uh, yeah, well, there's a question in the survey that uh, asks if patients have had an aneurysm, but uh, we don't really go in specifics. So also at the end of the, question, uh, at the questionnaire, there are questions regarding the health states of patients, which they can fill out uh, if anything, well, if there were any major events in the last year. Uh, but we didn't really specifically look at it. You mentioned that survival data was used in your reimbursement issues. Can you explain that a little more fully? Um, well, um, for example, in, uh, in Australia, uh, there has been recently a really well problem uh, getting the gover government uh, so far to uh, well pay for, uh, for, the, for the treatment. So you'll need as much evidence as possible that uh, treatment uh, works and that it has a positive effect on the, the patient. And, uh, well, a study that says if you treat a patient, uh, he will have less, a smaller chance to die, that can be seen as a positive thing, since survival is uh, an important outcome. Thanks. I have a uh, few consent forms in my bag, so uh, <laughs> feel free to uh, pick one up. Thank you. So um, um, many uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to present. Uh, I think I'll take this off now. Uh, tenure data <laughs> um, on the uh, Pompeii registry. Um, I'm at UC Irvine, uh, and actually I do want to thank Genzyme for investing in me when I only had one patient, and we have really grown uh, leaps and bounds, so um, that little uh, investment uh, has really gone a long way. So many of you know that the objectives of the Pompeii Registry are to enhance understanding of the variability, progression, identification of manifestations, new manifestations, and natural history of those, um, to characterize Pompeii disease as a whole. Um, so we really want everybody's participation, echoing uh, previous speakers. Um, it helps um, uh, uh, present, um, uh, prepare reports, and also develop recommendations uh, for patients in terms of surveillance. <coughs> So it is a multi-center uh, uh, multi international observational program. As you heard, we're not doing anything um, invasive other than just gathering uh, what's considered routine patient care. Uh, established in uh, 2014, so it's the 10-year anniversary, and as of uh, June this year, there are 1,459 patients from 34 countries. So you see there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, and this um, figure shows you how exponentially the recruitment uh, has grown over the, the last 10 years. Um, what you see in blue, so the, the population's been divided into two main groups. So uh, the infantile group are those patients that are diagnosed uh, below the age of 12 months <coughs> and they have cardiomyopathy. Or the uh, late onset uh, type um, uh, includes those individuals who are either um, diagnosed under 12 months without cardiomyopathy or over a year. <coughs> and then there is a group for which there was uh, no information. That's the group in, um, in green uh, as to when they were diagnosed. So this is patient enrollment by region and the largest uh, group are in Europe. Um, uh, lumped uh, uh, as a whole, um, uh, 823 from uh, Europe and 445 from North America, includes um, US and Canada. 
um, 144 from Japan and uh, Asia Pacific region, and then Latin America 47. So see, still large regions uh, of the globe that are not represented. Uh, so it is voluntary. Uh, patients need to sign an inf informed consent form, and they must have two GAA uh, mutations, although there are patients who um, are accepted in the registry if they have uh, some manifestations. Um, so this is um, looking at the enrollment uh, in Pompe disease according to uh, country. Uh, see, the U.S. Uh, has the largest um, at, with 352 and, and so forth. Um, so looking at uh, the infantile onset group, uh, there were 178 accrued um, in the 10 years and um, um, equal, almost equal male and female distribution for an autosomal recessive disorder. Um, and the age of uh, onset of symptoms was uh, 2.9 months. Um, let me see if I can use my pointer um, there, 2.9, whoops, uh, 2.9 months and, yeah, okay. Uh, and the age of diagnosis was uh, uh, four months. Um, the mean age of infusion was um, 7.3 months. So there's still quite a gap. Um, if you look at the uh, late onset group, um, there were um, a total of 1,020, uh, almost equal distribution there, more males. And the age of symptom onset was 27 uh, years, and uh, age of uh, diagnosis, 36.6 years, you see there. And the mean age of infusion was more than 10 years after the age of um, uh, onset of symptoms. <coughs> so a lot of work that's needed. So if you look at the um, symptoms uh, in, this, uh, in these two groups, uh, for those that were in the infantile group, um, the, the vast majority of them have got uh, symptoms such as um, um, respiratory um, distress, uh, developmental delays, failure to thrive, um, weakness in almost uh, all uh, uh, the patients, as you see there, um, here. Um, uh, frequency of falls, uh, ambulation with difficulty, non-ambulatory, um, yeah, quite, uh, actually this is not uh, quite right, so this is a percentage of uh, the, those that uh, are non-ambulatory. Okay, so um, looking at the um, individuals with uh, late onset uh, type uh, in the thousand, these are the features in those um, uh, individuals, so shortness of breath after exercise um, in, uh, what is it, 70% or so, um, proximal weakness in the upper extremities, lower extremities, uh, trunk, ambulation with difficulty, and then about 14% uh, uh, of uh, individuals actually lose, have lost their um, ambulation uh, during the surveillance. Uh, looking at the ERT, so enzyme replacement uh, uh, therapy, uh, in these four uh, geographic areas, um, you can see that uh, more than 60% of individuals across the globe are having um, enzyme. Of course, it would be nice to see 100% um, in, in these regions. Um, so uh, the data from uh, the Pompey Registry has been uh, published in four peer-reviewed journals, and I'm hoping that uh, the authors of those um, articles will talk a little bit about their work, um, which has also been presented in 32 abstracts. Um, these are some of them. Um, 2011, Barry Byrne um, looked at data from uh, 2004 to 2009. There were 742 patients, and then um, the vast majority of uh, these individuals were late onset type, and um, they also found that there was a, a group that um, appeared to have a, a later age of onset um, than their peers um, with cardiomyopathy. Right, so uh, uh, a group uh, in those uh, individuals who had symptoms uh, below 12 who did not have cardiomyopathy and 78% uh, had enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, here's another paper where they looked at scoliosis um, data, and um, scoliosis was present in a third, um, more frequent in children and juveniles. Um, only um, 
18% of those with a diagnosis in infancy had a scoliosis, and the majority of individuals who were wheelchair users uh, had uh, scoliosis, 62%. Um, so a large, they also found that um, scoliosis did have implications regarding um, respiratory uh, support. Um, more individuals, 44% versus 27% without scoliosis uh, required um, respiratory support. Um, and pulmonary function was reduced in all uh, three age groups, um, in those that had scoliosis versus those that didn't. Uh, and the third group was um, looking at individuals um, with onset after age 12, um, sorry, um, with uh, diagnosis after age 12 um, compared to the uh, groups that I've mentioned already. So um, Priya um, also looked at, um, sorry, Dr. Kishnani uh, looked at the um, uh, age of, um, let me see, what, what is this? Um, okay, so the diagnostic gap between those that had symptoms and those that, um, and, and when they were diagnosed and um, found that the longest gap was in um, infantile patients um, that did not have cardiomyopathy. If you had respiratory or muscular um, skeletal signs and symptoms, you had the shortest um, uh, diagnostic gap. So you're more likely to be diagnosed with Pompe disease than those that did not have uh, the classical features, which um, you've already heard. Um, also, they, they looked at um, uh, the way of diagnosis in these patients and found that uh, over the course of the 10 years that where um, enzyme um, uh, activity was used in 62%, it's now 87% of individuals um, are having their enzyme um, tested in a dried blood spot uh, for diagnosis. Uh, and DNA mutation analysis has uh, really grown from uh, 23 to 54%. Um, all of this has led to reduced uh, use of muscle biopsies uh, in the diagnosis. Uh, of course, muscle biopsies are still done in those complex uh, cases, and uh, fibroblasts as well, um, as you heard. Uh, but more and more DNA um, uh, blood-based assays are being used for diagnosis, and, and Genzyme does offer a free program to um, diagnose these individuals. So a lot of these activities are published in um, uh, two publications, uh, one of which is here, um, and uh, one's for physicians, one one's for patients. You can also read a little bit, uh, sorry, hear a little bit about this in a YouTube that was made uh, recently on the Pompeii Registry. Um, and um, so uh, that's really all I have to present on the 10-year data. I would also like to take the opportunity to share a little bit about our experience at UC Irvine. So we currently follow 17 patients, and uh, as I mentioned, I started with one um, about eight years or so ago. Uh, and um, we, we really have um, uh, created a, a very uh, comprehensive multidisciplinary clinic. <clears throat> it offers one-stop um, uh, clinic visits for patients, they come every uh, six months, and we do um, a, a lot of evaluations during uh, that visit for the registry. <clears throat> so these are the tests that we administer, so it's a pretty long visit for uh, many patients who are actually quite exhausted by the time they're done. Um, so we do uh, motor testing, the, um, the GAO MRC, handheld dynamometry, um, some of these are questionnaires. We do the six-minute walk test, um, uh, look at the quality of life with some of the questionnaires that you heard already. We do pulmonary function studies and um, we do vital capacity, both um, erect and uh, supine, so they're sitting when they're doing it. and, and um, you heard that the um, um, diaphragm uh, is uh, really, uh, so, so the vital capacity um, has um, uh, impact on uh, how much of a decrease you see in the vital capacity when they're supine, and it uh, informs us uh, of those patients that are at risk of uh, needing uh, ventilatory support. So we also do the um, maximum inspiratory pressures, uh, also known as negative inspiratory force, and the SNF, um, which is the uh, 
sniff nasal um, inspiratory pressure. So they, they have a little probe in their nostril and they sniff and you want to uh, capture how much negative um, pressure they're able to generate uh, uh, in their chest. And we do the routine uh, blood and urine um, studies. And uh, in the outpatient um, uh, setting, they're having echoes, EKGs um, every year, audiology, depending on their needs, uh, brain image imaging if there are symptoms, uh, DEXA scans every one to two years, um, chest spine x-rays, and sleep studies um, if needed. So this is the, the um, a spreadsheet on the first 13 patients and what was remarkable to me is how many of these patients have novel mutations. So you see the majority of them have novel mutations and um, I'm trying to think why the, the, the top two are um, in color. I think that there was cardiomyopathy uh, in both and then in one patient it actually improved. Uh, in both patients it improved after they started uh, enzyme uh, treatment. Um, what I also want to show you is the, some of the other features. So there was one patient with aneurysm and we know now that that is um, part of um, um, you know, the manifestations of um, Pompe disease in some individuals. So we do do MRIs if there are any symptoms suggestive, um, you know, like headaches, etc. cetera. Uh, tinnitus, which is uh, ringing off the ears, was seen on four. Um, uh, individuals um, out of the 39 of them required BiPAP, one had scoliosis, um, maybe I'm not doing such a good job looking, uh, looking for those, um, um, you know, the, sc uh, the scoliosis in patients, uh, osteoporosis in two on DEXA scan and so forth. Um, uh, so these are two individuals had cardiomyopathy, actually it's, uh, one is down here, so I can't remember why the, the red. Um, uh, infusion reactions, so although antibodies were elevated in um, two individuals, only one um, had an infusion reaction which was uh, treated very nicely with a regimen that has been um, used successfully um, by Dr. Kishnani. One had peripheral neuropathy, uh, one has been trached, and so forth. Uh, actually, I did mention, I do want to mention that there was one patient with testicular cancer and I know of one other. Um, and then two had hypothyroidism, um, which is quite common in the population anyway, so I'm not sure if it's part of the natural history of um, Pompe disease. So we uh, track um, uh, everything that I mentioned. This is an example of the six minute walk test. So you see not everybody is um, uh, you know, Im improving vastly after enzymes, so that's the ERT treatment. This individual is fairly stable. This individual really uh, improved enormously. This individual declined and so forth, um, but we need more, more data. I haven't been following uh, several patients for uh, long enough to know what's happening. Um, we track all their labs that I mentioned. The HEX4 has been really useful to see how um, you know, well they're clearing all the glycogen stores. Um, I mentioned we do all the pulmonary function studies um, uh, that I um, noted before. And um, this is to show you the um, difference that we see between the erect and supine. And, uh, um, our thinking is that anybody with more than 8% difference is um, indicating that there is some diaphragmatic weakness, but you heard that 25% is, is what um, you see in, in several individuals, which actually these people are showing over here. So these individuals have got stable PFDs over the course of their um, three years or so of infusion, actually more in um, the one on the uh, left and um, seven years and on the right. Um, oops, where am I going? Okay, and then these are some individuals who are showing that there is a um, decrease of their um, pulmonary function test. So you see here that the vital capacity is decreasing and uh, as is the, the SNP um, and so forth. Um, so um, as was mentioned before, we don't always see a correlation between what patients experience themselves and what the uh, the figures tell us, um, but this is a, a useful guide uh, to help us uh, if patients are reluctant to start enzyme, you know, we look at the data and um, this patient in particular was um, convinced um, about starting enzyme uh, treatment and uh, she's doing very well. 
So um, as a result of being a center, we've been able to attract many companies, um, sponsor, company sponsored studies, but also investigator initiated uh, studies. You um, probably heard about uh, Dr. Dwight Corbell's uh, clenbuterol studies. So we have several patients who participate in that. Um, I have um, initiated um, an exercise study where we're exercising the um, certain muscle groups as well as their um, respiratory muscles and we're looking forward to recruiting our 10 subjects for that study. Um, let me see, what am I doing here? Okay. Uh, and uh, Dr. Mosefa, who um, also runs the clinic um, uh, together with um, my group, uh, his group and my group uh, in the MDA clinic, um, has a, um, a genzyme sponsored study called Ipanema where they're uh, looking at um, uh, patients who are uh, registered in neuromuscular clinics with limb girdle muscular um, uh, clinical features who do not have a diagnosis um, with the expectation of uh, that many of them uh, have Pompe disease that are, um, that are missed. So I'd like to acknowledge patients and families without whom I wouldn't be here right now, um, the healthcare providers who love coming to their cl uh, the clinic, they're unpaid, they, they just um, enjoy uh, the interaction with the patients and, and the camaraderie of uh, all the healthcare providers there, the researchers who um, put a lot of effort into um, uh, you know, what, what we do in terms of the registry, recruiting patients for our study, and of course the, the sponsors. And then that's our team, um, so you can see on the right here that it's a pretty extensive team. Um, the, um, uh, so the team consists of um, uh, geneticists, me, a genetic counselor. We have counseling students because we have a genetic counseling program. Um, Dr. Mozafa, Dr. Namita Goyal, Dr. Cash, who's actually now a um, faculty neurologist, um, fellows, um, project specialists, uh, research assistants, physical therapists, uh, respiratory therapists, um, social worker, MDA representative, and um, nutrition. Um, and the numbers are growing. Of course, um, you know, we refer patients to cardiology, audiology, neurosurgeons, um, you know, uh, all the various specialties, the specialists that they need. Um, I didn't have a picture of Dr. Mozafa then, but here he is in the middle with um, Dr. Goyal and uh, Dr. Cash. So, so that's all. I will take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is really a, a very rich source of information that we, we should exploit a little bit more even have it more published and uh, that it's accessible to people. Um, there are some questions. I Can I first go over there? I'm coming. Okay, I hope you could tell a little bit more about uh, the gap you were talking about between diagnosis and infusion. You mentioned it's the numbers and that there's a lot of work to be done, but maybe a little bit more explicit about what it is that you think is driving that gap and what you mean by the work to be done. Okay, so uh, really more awareness. I feel that we need to make people more aware of this as a possibility. So. Um, with my first patient um, uh, that I mentioned, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, this patient had been to a neurologist and had been given many diagnoses with Pompe not being considered at all until Dr. Mozafa saw that individual and, and diagnosed him with Pompe disease. So it's um, really more awareness. I personally have um, uh, been involved with uh, many f uh, family members having been um, given this, you know, enormous battery of tests for disorders that was staring at them in the face. If only they had asked a family history. There's a sibling, uh, two siblings with Pompe disease, and yet they're being investigated for all kinds of weird disorders. So, so that that kind of awareness, patients. Um, um, 
you know, tell us a lot, but, but uh, the physicians don't always uh, add two and two together. So really knowing that this is a familial disorder, being more aware of um, individuals within the families that have similar symptoms, and doing maybe preventative testing. So as part of um, the, the work I do uh, with the registry, we actually do go to patients' homes if needed, and then you know gather the family members, and we've been able to detect people People who are, you know, think they're fine, are in denial, or can't be bothered uh, going and being tested. So it's um, the registry has helped us um, diagnose more patients. You mentioned that after oh, diagnosis, diagnosis, there's a gap. Treatment. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, um, sometimes patients don't want to be um, on enzyme treatment because it is a big life change, right? They have to go in and spend half a day or more um, uh, having uh, their infusions. Sometimes insurance takes a while. Um, sometimes their physicians um, don't believe in enzyme. There, there are a lot of reasons. And I'm sure that there will be discussions um, you know, by other speakers about that. It takes time. Um, I just wanted to make a comment, I think, to the question you're asking. Um, because in that paper, what we had shown was that 12-year uh, gap from diagnosis to when treatment was initiated. And this was for the um, individuals, as Henrika also showed, who were diagnosed very early in the first year of life but did not have cardiac involvement, as a result of which they were given often labels of cerebral palsy or developmental delay or hypotonia of unknown cause. And this is the subgroup of children that we really, really worry about and which we hope that we can capture with newborn screening because they do have um, involvement and would have benefited uh, or would benefit from early treatment, the gap there is extremely long in that subgroup of patients. I think that's what you were asking about. That's where the big diagnostic odyssey uh, where we worry about, and I know that Laura Case, who's in this audience, would say that as a physical therapist, she really looks out. And we have had a couple of referrals now come from physical therapy with these concerns and have ended up with the diagnosis of Pompe disease. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Thank you. Um, I Patients, what we do. Can you repeat the question? But I, okay. I, I couldn't get it. But my okay. Do, do you mind asking that question again then? Okay. <laughs> okay. So you, you're wanting to know how is the data captured from the Genzyme registry being used by the patient and their physicians? Okay. So, um, you know, th the, the data that I presented is what's in here, and then some of the additional data that has been published that you heard from Dr. Uh, Kishnani. But as an individual physician for my patients, it has been enormously helpful because it tells me how the patient's being, um, how, how the patient's changing over time. So. Um, we have made changes in the infusion, increasing the dose sometimes, increasing the frequency, um, you know, helping um, uh, get the patient approved for um, a BiPAP, et cetera. You know, so, so it's been very helpful because without that framework, I feel patients get lost. They don't have a regular routine follow-up schedule um, and, and may not be receiving optimum care. So I think it's really useful from a physician's perspective, and I hope the patients like to see the feedback that they receive in clinic as to how they're doing, because we're charting the dynamometry, their uh, respiratory function test, their six-minute walk test, et cetera, their fatigue scale. Mm -hmm. Yes. These up here are wireless. Sorry, it's, it's to talk. Oh, do you want to move that? So oh. I'm just going to steal this. I, I think there's one question over there. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead and answer your <laughs> ask yours. We have time for questions. Yeah, so, um, yeah. I would like to ask you among the group that you mentioned, what's the ethnic city and the races? And how do people find your clinic? Oh, thank you. Well, um, so, you know, we um, rely on the, the, the patients actually, um, you know, by, by word of mouth, we, they hear about us. Um, they, they see that, you know, they're getting benefit from the clinic. So that's how they come to our clinic. Um, you know, Genzyme also they're they're following patients, they're uh, following families, and and they refer patients if they know that their a relative has been diagnosed recently. Um, you know, so they, they they find us eventually. But there are many physicians who are taking care of patients, so uh, they're not all coming. You know, in in our region even, they're not all coming to our center. They're they're seeing other neurologists, etc., other geneticists. Mm -hmm. You, uh, my question is uh, more of a concern because um, in in Southern California, <coughs> um, if a patient of uh, Asian descent or, you know, or minority groups, I mean, they the exposure of if they were to f try to find a, ki uh, uh, a treatment, it probably be difficult. Is there some kind of effort to to educate among the, the, the health uh, service providers? Or is there some sort of system that can expose the, the, the opportunities for treatment or diagnosis? Yeah, I, I, that's a very good question. So um, obviously much more outreach is needed to um, inform healthcare providers who might be seeing these patients. Um, so they're not all, you know, necessarily coming to um, neuromuscular clinics, you know, they're, they're going, you know, to um, see other neurologists, maybe um, uh, pulmonologists, etc. So we have an outreach program where we actually do uh, do uh, grand rounds, one-on-one um, -on -one, um, education sessions um, in the clinic. We're bringing um, the healthcare providers uh, to learn more about the disease, so they're more aware. Um, so, so that's all we can do. You know, we, uh, uh, once newborn screening comes, of course, they'll everybody will be diagnosed, which of course opens up another can of worms. But um, um, I, I think we just have to you know, uh, try and do our best in increasing awareness. And regarding uh, the ethnic groups, I, I really don't have that information, but you know, in our um, place, we have um, uh, all uh, patients of all nationalities who are coming to our clinic. Um, and I, I don't know the data whether they're diagnosed later compared to, um, uh, in, you know, Caucasian uh, patients. Maybe somebody else knows. Right. Mm-hmm. There you go. Okay. I have a question about the abnormal brain imaging. Um, the, one of the previous physicians had mentioned the white matter abnormality. Um, I saw on the Genzyme registry that it only mentioned aneurysm. Are there other abnormalities that the registry in the U.S. is looking at? Um, and how are they deciphering that? Are there any long-term studies to see what that white matter right. um, effect so is? The, the MRI data that I showed was just in my cohort. Um, that is not necessarily data that is available right now from Genzyme. Maybe, um, Priya, do you want to take this question? Because um, it is hard actually getting some of the data um, because, you know, obviously no data is perfect, but. Um. Is it going to be Priya or Ons or both? <laughs> <laughs> so I can just speak on behalf of um, members from the Pompeii Registry, which includes uh, ANS. I think the registry is an um, excellent forum to gather overall data, but I think the details sometimes cannot be captured uh, via registry. Um, some of our appeals as a registry team is to 
ask treating physicians to put in as much data as possible. And I think the registry does take time to enter the data, uh, to put in the data, but I think the output is extremely helpful. So some of these unanswered questions about uh, what do the um, children, the infantile survivors look like, what are some of these other changes. Um, I think that the registry has the ability to continue to add data points um, so that even if it wasn't in the registry as it stands today, we have the ability to make those changes to the reg registry so that we can continue to gather it. But I think some of the questions that you have asked would have to be answered by uh, centers that see larger numbers and can do the close follow-up as Dr. Kimonis mentioned. And uh, then it becomes those groups of physicians working together to bring those kind of detailed data out. So um, the registry is tremendous. I would still support and recommend to en every treating physician to enter as much as possible uh, for it. Hans, did you? Yeah, Hans wants to add. <laughs> I would like to add. Of course, I completely agree with you, uh, Priya, that uh, the registry is very important and that we should uh, add data. And I think it's also important for patients uh, to participate and to ask their physicians to uh, participate in the registry because I think what was also uh, uh, mentioned earlier, we need the data to get more insight in the effects of uh, ERT of the natural course. And also, if there are future therapies, uh, we also need the data. But now uh, about a specific question uh, uh, that was mentioned, you asked uh, what about the white matter disturbances. Um, I would like to set something uh, right, uh, straight, in so far that white matter abnormalities are mainly uh, seen in the infants. And what uh, Hanrike van der Hout was talking about was the long-term follow-up of infants who are on enzyme replacement therapy. And there is no indication at this moment that there is white matter abnormality in the adults with pompous disease. So what has, been <coughs> what has been described is that there, are, um, there may be aneurysms, uh, and what has been discussed is that uh, there is storage of glycogen in the vessel wall of, of, the, yeah, of the vessels, because the vessels uh, have a smooth muscle, and in this smooth muscle also glycogen may uh, store, and it's disputed, but it could be true that um, if you have an aneurysm, that this is caused by the dilatation of the vessels uh, because of the storage and the weakening of the vessel wall, and that might cause the aneurysm. <coughs> there is no indication at all at this moment that there is also storage of glycogen in the brain of adults. And uh, definitely not to an extent that it really causes uh, white matter abnormalities. So that is uh, what I would like to add. Thank you. Thank you so much for those Thanks. excellent responses. Yeah, thank you. Oh. More questions? Oh, there is more. OK. OK. It's behind you. OK. OK, it works. Um, I, I, I noticed that, that in the registry you mentioned that Somewhere around I don't know, 12 or 13 percent of the individuals were infantile onset patients, and I was wondering if uh, one can conclude that that is a reasonable estimation of the frequency of or the relative frequency of infantile onset classic with, with cardiomyopathy. So yeah, it's a it's a little more than that. Um, so I would say that really um, it's, we don't have full data to um, you know, make that a conclusion because it is you know, self-reported information. Uh, we're relying on, on the physicians to report their patients. So it may be that it is more frequent that these patients are not being diagnosed. Um, we all know of situations such as that. Again, I might ask the experts to comment, but I'd say with 10 years of worth of data, that looks like the proportion. Um, so the adult type is generally, you know, three-quarter of all patients with Pompe disease um, compared to the infantile type. Is that fair comment? Yeah. Okay. And then you had a question? Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I am actually having a comment concerning the group of patients which are less than 12 months of age, and uh, actually these patients are very difficult to diagnose because usually we don't diagnose Pompe disease unless the patient is presenting with cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. And when it, uh, the patient presents only with hypotonia, etc., we uh, think about others such as congenital muscular dystrophy or, con or congenital myopathies, etc. So what I learned really is that patient coming with hypotonia, we have to include the enzyme AC for pompe disease among the other differential diagnoses we are doing um, for our patient. This is one. The other one is that I want to ask about the percentage of this patient to diagnose less than 12 months um, uh, with uh, only uh, myopathy, without cardiomyopathy, among the infantile group in the registry. So, uh, so that's the, sorry, let me go back and um, get that data. Okay. So, okay. So this is it. Okay, so um, the, the group that has cardiomyopathy, you know, I don't have the, the split between the, the group that is under 12 months with cardiomyopathy versus those that are with, you know, without cardiomyopathy. Uh, because they've been lumped into this late onset type. If uh, uh, some, yeah, Priya, do you want to help me with this um, question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, you should have been no, up no. here doing this. <laughs> Next time we do 50. <laughs> I, okay, I, I'll walk. Yes, I'll, I'll listen to that. Um, but there are two-thirds of us here and one-third of you there, so you walk two-thirds. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in response to that, uh, Virginia, we don't have detailed numbers, mm -hmm. and, um, but if you look at it, it's about 10% where, where, where we would say it, but I think the newborn screening data that's emerging from uh, Missouri and now also from